Hi everyone and welcome to this introductory video lecture in the Powder Storage and Flow course. This first lecture is going to focus primarily on some background material, why we're interested in powder storage and flow, and some statistics related to that, really just to kind of motivate the topic. So go ahead and take a look at your screen. You'll see on here I have a number of different products that are shown. These are all particulate materials in some way or another. I won't go through all of them, but you can see up here, for example, we have some pharmaceutical materials, something like 90% plus uh, materials in the pharmaceutical industry, the, the drug products are in particulate form, like a capsule or a tablet. Here we have a granular fertilizer that's very common for agricultural applications, some powdered spices, a lot of food products are actually in particulate form. You can see here some M&Ms that are also in powder form. Here we have a dishwashing detergent pod, so that's just really compressed powder that you throw in your dishwasher. Plastic pellets up here in the upper right, some cosmetics. Uh, this is a biomass material. I'm not quite sure exactly what it is, but maybe compressed wood chips, for example, put into pelleted form, or like sawdust in pelleted form that's used for heating, for example. A lot of batteries actually have compressed powder anodes and cathodes. Of course, that's a very timely topic nowadays. Uh, here's some powdered laundry detergent. So a lot of different products have particulates as the, the final form of the material or the product. And in many cases, uh, there's a powder in the intermediate form. For example, let's think about bread. Bread you wouldn't think of as a particulate material product, but in the manufacture of bread, of course you use flour and flour's uh, powdered material. So powder may be in some sort of intermediate stage. So let's move on. So the first thing I want to do is define what we mean by particle science and technology, or sometimes I'll call it powder science and engineering. To do that definition, I just went straight to the Particle Technology Forum, or PTF. That's a subset within the AICHE, that's the American Institute of Chemical Engineering. You can go to their website right here if you want to learn more about it. It's a good organization that promotes research related to particle science and technology. And anyway, they define particle technology as a branch of science and engineering dealing with production, handling, modification, and use of a wide variety of particulate products. I think it's important to underline this because really particle science and technology or particle science and engineering deals with the whole range of handling particulate materials. So all the way from, I would, I would even put raw materials in here, so like mining for example, so getting the raw materials, handling them, production might refer to actually producing crystals for example, you know, making the actual particulate material or, or like I said mining it, handling it, modifying it, so that's during manufacturing, changing the form, to something that's useful, and then use, so that's the final product. So it spans the whole range of dealing with those particulate materials. And they can be wet or dry, and they can have quite a range of sizes, down from nanometers to centimeters, and uh, maybe even bigger if you're dealing with, uh, like I said, mining, for example, you might be dealing with rocks and boulders, which are even bigger. And its scope spans a wide range of industries that I've talked about a little bit on that first slide, you know, chemical industry, pharmaceutical industries right here, petrochemical, etc. So a lot of different industries, and I'll talk more about that in just a moment. So particle science and technology, or particle science and engineering, it's very common in industry. It spans a wide range of industries, and it spans uh, a wide range of handling, I would say, you know, from, from dealing with the mining or production of the particulate materials to their end use. So who's interested in particle technology? I list here some general categories of industries. This were, these were kind of on the previous slide as well. Again, chemical industry, agrochemical, these are the pharmaceuticals, etc. Food product, I've talked about that before. Agricultural, just, you know, for example, harvesting corn, uh, wheat, soybeans, things like that. Those are all in particulate form. Consumer products, I mentioned detergents and batteries. Uh, the military is interested here, for example, because uh, a lot of energetic materials are in particulate form. So like explosive materials or materials used in solid rocket motors and such, they're often in particulate form during their handling. So you can see a wide range of example industries and a wide range of example companies. This list here is uh, perhaps a little bit older. For example, Dow and DuPont relatively recently merged and then split up into some smaller companies. But the point I wanted to make with this list of companies is that there are a lot, a lot of big and small companies that deal with particulate materials. And by the way, I got this list from a website, uh, Jenneke and Johansson. Jenneke and Johansson, it's a consulting company that deals with a lot of particulate handling issues. So they have a lot of good information on their website. So why do we need courses in particle technology? Why are you taking this course? 
Uh, well, first of all, most engineers and scientists, especially in the United States, really only have exposure to fluids, like liquids and gases, and pure solids. We really don't have much exposure to particulate material. And that's unfortunate since so much particulate material is handled in practice. And so if you only have exposure to fluids and pure solids, then you might design systems that are handling particulate materials based on that fluid mechanics knowledge, for example. And as you'll see a little bit later, that, that really isn't always the best way to do things. So you might design system based on improper assumptions about material behavior. Secondly, much of the design and operation of processes involving particulates involves trial and error and scale up. So if you're involved in the industry, you'll see there are a lot of design of experiments. You know, we, people try handling the particulate material under a wide range of conditions to see what works, what doesn't work, rather than doing predictive mechanics-based design. So it's just a lot of trial and error through experimentation. And then there's a lot of scale up as well. So you go from the lab scale to uh, perhaps a pilot scale and then to the manufacturing scale or maybe another scale in between. It just all adds up to a, a lot of time, a lot of resources, it's a lot of money. So it works somewhat, but it's, it's really not the most efficient way of doing things. It'd be much better if we had some mechanics-based models that we could use to do some predictive modeling, tell us what's gonna happen at these different scales or under different conditions and then minimize the amount of trial and error and uh, scale-up testing that we have to do. We'd probably still want to do those things, but we'd, we'd like to minimize it. So more modeling would be helpful. So, I and mean, that requires understanding of how particulate materials behave. The third bullet point here, a few U.S. academic programs are focused on particle science and technology, particularly at the undergraduate level. There are some graduate programs that focus on uh, particulate science and engineering. They're few and far between in the United States. Our undergraduate programs have very little. I'm in a mechanical engineering department. We have nothing dealing with particulates. Chemical engineering departments might have a little bit, but it's, it's not really a fundamental topic. It's not widespread. So we could certainly do a lot more. So this very small course is just a, a small step in that direction. And then if we did have more exposure to these topics, the idea is that hopefully we can improve designs so that uh, we have more efficient manufacturing operations and perhaps design new and more effective products for the consumers. So that's really the, the end goal is to try to, to save energy, save money, save time, and produce new products that are useful to people. That's the goal, ideally, for a course like the one that you're taking. So the next couple of slides are focused on some miscellaneous statistics to try to convince you that uh, the topic is important. Some of these are a little bit older, but I think they still make the point. So for example, this first bullet point says some 75% of chemical manufacturing processes involve small particle materials, what we call very small particles are sometimes called fine particles, whereas big particles are called coarse particles. So 75% of chemical manufacturing processes involve fine particles at some point. It's a lot of material. You can imagine the chemical industry deals with lots of materials. So 75% of that, it's a, it's a big number. Along that same vein, approximately one half of the products in at least three quarters of the raw materials in the chemical industry are in granular form. So this is uh, kind of on the same topic, uh, just slightly different numbers here. So the products would be the final end product and three quarters of the raw materials, that's the material coming into the facility. So again, huge amounts of material that are in particulate form, not just gases or liquids. Here in 1992, DuPont found that 62% of its 3,000 products involved particulate materials. Again, it's a very significant portion of their product, and DuPont was a very large company. And then here, a minimum of 40% or $61 billion of the value added to the chemical industry is linked to particle technology. So, you know, all four of these bullets really refer to the chemical industry, just one of the many industries that deal with particular materials. And you can see it's very important in that particular segment of industry. This slide shows a couple of interesting plots. Let's focus on the one in the upper left. By the way, these plots come from the Merrow report and a report by Tim Bell, where they studied different manufacturing facilities and looked at their performance. So what you're seeing in the upper left here is the average startup time in months for different manufacturing facilities ones that handled liquids and gases, so fluids, and ones that handled solids like particulate materials. So sometimes particulate materials are called bulk solids. So this is the feedstock. This is the material that they're, they're processing. And then you have planned and actual behavior. So planned was you know, the design, how long they thought it would take to start up the facility based on some design predictions, and then how long it actually took when they built the facility. And so you can see for liquids and gases, 
we're somewhere on the order of, I don't know, four to f three or four months. The planned or the designed startup time and the actual startup time were pretty close. So they designed them pretty well, things worked pretty well, it all started relatively quickly. But then when you started dealing with particulate materials, you can see they had planned to have the startup times in on the order of six months for these facilities. The actual startup time was closer to 20, I don't know what that number is, maybe 23 months, much, much longer in practice. What that means is that the design cases weren't very accurately predicted. So uh, they just didn't really have a good idea on how to predict how the material was going to behave, and it became much more problematic to get those facilities to start up. And you can see a similar kind of behavior over here in the bottom right. So this is the year-end percent of design rate. So they design the facility to operate with a certain throughput. How close are you to meeting that throughput in practice? So when you're dealing with liquids and gas feeds, so you know liquid and fluid feedstock material, the range of year-end performance is actually even greater than 100% in some cases. So they perform better than what they really thought. And then maybe down to about 60% here, with the median being about 90%. Now, I can't recall exactly how many facilities they looked at here, but it would be on the order of dozens. And then when you're dealing with the solid feed, so these are the particulate materials. So this is raw particulate material, and this is some particulate material that's been pre-processed you know, by maybe some other facility, and then they get a, a material that's a little bit easier to handle. And you can see that the, the range here is much larger. You have some facilities that, uh, when you're dealing with refined solid feed, you know, operated at 90% of the design rate, but some that were at zero. So quite a range with the median being about 50%. And then when you're dealing with raw particulate material, so the sort of unprocessed material, again, it went from zero up to maybe, uh, I can't see what that is, about 80%, but with the mean being, or median being about 38%. So much worse performance when you're dealing with particulate materials. And in some cases, some of those facilities didn't even produce anything. It was zero percent of the design rate. So quite a widespread. Again, this is indicative of not really understanding how to handle particulate materials well. And then I have a lot of other just miscellaneous statistics on this slide. These are just things that I picked up over the years. You know, grinding of particulates consumes about 1.3 percent of the U.S. electrical power production and more than 50% is devoted to minerals. So this is an important number because especially now with uh, the production of batteries for electric vehicles, for example, there's gonna be a lot more mining of those materials here in the United States. And obviously we would like to reduce the amount of power that's required to collect and uh, crush basically those materials. You can see it's a significant portion of the US electrical power. Here uh, it says each year over a thousand silos and bins fail in North America. So a silo bin and hopper, these are basically storage vessels. You know, a large cylinder, maybe like a large funnel shape. It seems pretty straightforward, right? They're just there to hold material and then discharge it when the material is needed. So just emptying through gravity through a, basically a hole in the bottom. Uh, yet uh, on the order of a thousand of these things fail every year. It's one of the simplest devices, but they can collapse, they can buckle. Uh, they just don't flow very well in many cases. So even the simplest devices, uh, people have problems with. In Mexico, 5 million tons of corn is handled each year. It's a lot of corn, 30% of which is lost due to poor handling systems. That's pretty significant. That, that's, we're talking about food products. This isn't even the processed material. This is just the, the raw material coming from the field. Uh, we're losing about 30% of it. So that's, that's food that doesn't get to people. 2014, the world produced nearly 100 million metric tons of urea in particulate form. And uh, urea is really a very common agricultural fertilizer, pr provides nitrogen to plants. Huge amounts of urea are manufactured and often they're in granulated or particulate in maybe like a powdered form. So again, if we can find better ways to do that manufacturing, make it more efficient, uh, we could save quite a bit of money. North American and the Oceana region, approximately 500 million metric tons of cereal grains, which are in granular form, are lost during distribution processing and other stages of handling. That kind of goes back to this one about Mexico and handling of corn. So again, huge amounts of food products, so here are cereal grains, they're just being lost due to poor handling. So obviously we'd like to reduce that. And then lastly, approximately 50% of the world's energy resources are derived from granular systems such as soils, grains, and biomass. So for example, uh, I'm involved in a Department of Energy uh, project where we're processing 
corn stover to try to turn it into ethanol. And of course, there are other materials like wood chips and switchgrass and things like that that can be used to produce ethanol, for example, or energy. So uh, quite a bit of the world's energy resources come from these kinds of particulate materials. The next slide here that I show is really focused more on the pharmaceutical industry. I've got a lot of background in pharmaceutical manufacturing. Here it says the pharmaceutical industry relies extensively on particulate materials with approximately 90% of drug products consisting of solid dosage forms. So the solid dosage forms are ones that they're not liquids, obviously. They're solids, things like tablets or capsules, for example. And so 90% of the drug products are in that form. So a lot of handling of particulate materials. And then the next bullet point says two economic models effectively bound the range of potential future benefits from greater manufacturing efficiency and estimate that, for example, if you could a 30% reduction in manufacturing costs will generate between one and $12.3 trillion in social value to the United States. So if we could find ways to make the manufacturing pharmaceuticals more efficient, then those savings could go to R&D, for example, to perhaps find other drug materials, so it, the active pharmaceutical ingredients, and that could go on to benefit people in a significant way. So improving on manufacturing can save money that can be implied then elsewhere to produce new products. And then this last one here says approximately 30% of pharmaceutical materials are lost due to powder segregation. So segregation is the unintentional separation of powder components. So if you have two free-flowing particulate materials, if they're of different size, they'll tend to separate um, or unmix. And we don't really want that to happen in many cases. So when that unmixing occurs, you, you don't get good content uniformity and you have to discard that material. And so this particular statistic said about 30% of the material can suffer from segregation, then you have to throw it away. That often happens at the end of discharge from a hopper, for example. Something we'll talk about a little bit later, but basically like a, a funnel shape. And then as the material discharges at the very end, you'll get a lot of segregation. The, the, the surface, the free surface of that discharging material will be a very significant V shape. And so materials tend to actually segregate in that that region. And then, like I said, you can get poor content uniformity and you have to get rid of that material. So this next slide just gives links to a number of different online videos that I encourage you to watch on your own time. These are really how things are made videos. So there's a video on how detergents are made, pills, tablets really, uh, how flour is made, you know, chocolate. All these things deal with particulate materials and so these videos are just, they're kind of fun. There's really nothing technical. They just show some of the equipment that's involved uh, in the manufacturing of these things. But I thought it'd be, you know, you could take a look at these on your own. They're often sort of fun to watch. Now let's talk specifically about powder flow. You know, there are many different aspects to particle science and engineering or particle science and technology. And I wanted to focus on powder flow in particular. So there's this organization called the International Fine Particle Research Institute, or IFPRI for short. And it's a consortium of dozens of companies from a wide range of manufacturing sectors, uh, but they all have an interest in particulate materials. And what they did is they surveyed their constituents to find out what particle science and engineering topics are important to what kinds of audience within their company. So the audience is shown here. So operations, product R&D, process design, plant engineering, and as far as the Powder, powder science and technology topics, those are all listed here. You can see powder flow, uh, drying, crystallization, etc. And what they found is powder flow was the most important topic that really was most important for just about everyone. Maybe plant engineering, the, the characterization of particles by side, size was a little bit more important, but it was pretty close. So powder flow seemed to be the most important topic for the whole range of audience here. So that's really motivates this course, powder storage and flow. We want to just make sure we're covering a, a topic that's of interest to a lot of people. Let's say we do have some powder flow issues. What, what, what are the common things that we tend to see? And we're going to talk about these more in detail later in the course, but I just wanted to give you a little introduction. So I'm going to just show you some pictures and um, describe some of the issues that people find. So for example, a hopper wall stress distribution. So here we have a hopper, so it's like a cylindrical section with a funnel, and then you would typically have an opening here at the bottom that the material would flow through. If we plotted the stress on the wall of this hopper as a function of depth, we'd get the picture on the, on the right-hand side. So this is, imagine this is the normal stress into the wall. So here's the normal stress. This is depth. One thing that you find is that 
the stresses actually start to asthmatote. You get this asthmatotic behavior where the stresses just reach some sort of constant value. And then right at this transition point where you go into the conical section, there's this jump in the stress. We call this a switch stress. Again, we're going to talk more about these things later in the course. Stress goes up suddenly, and then it starts to decrease until you approach the apex of the hopper. If you were dealing with an incompressible liquid, the stresses would just increase linearly with depth. You get a very different kind of behavior. So this is a good example of showing where intuition from fluid mechanics would uh, give you a very different expectation than what actually happens with the particulate material. And then on the right hand side, this is some experimental data in the hopper shown here. You can see this is, has a long cylindrical section with a smaller conical section with a very small angle, 15 degrees here. And you can see the stress is approaching some asymptotic behavior. There's the switch stress, and then it starts to decrease as you approach the apex. So that kind of stress distribution uh, affects how you would design that silo. For example, the switch stress here, you'd have to be very careful in designing for strength in that particular region so the switch stress doesn't cause significant damage to your device. Hopper flow mode. So now that the hopper is discharging, what does the, the flow pattern look like? So here I show the two sort of most common hopper flow modes. There are others. There are some intermediate cases, for example. But uh, the, the two most common are mass flow and funnel flow. So mass flow is here on the left. In a mass flow hopper, all of the material flows simultaneously. When you open the exit of the hopper, the material at the bottom moves, and then it, it all is moving. There's no stagnant region in here. And as it discharges, the surface of the material would stay more or less level as it discharges until you get to the very end, and then it'll produce sort of a V-shape. But it's a nice uniform flow, nothing stagnant. That's really what most people want when they discharge a hopper. Now, on the other side, we have funnel flow. And the reason we call it funnel flow is because the material that flows is actually kind of um, funneled through a central cavity. So here, the material that's flowing is in the middle. And then you get these stagnant regions on the side. So if you looked at what the free surface looked like here, it was as it discharged, you get that V-shape the whole time, where material is flowing down the free surface here and then into the channel. The problem with this kind of a flow is you get stagnant regions, and so let's say you have a material that it decays over time, some sort of biological material, then it would start to decay in those regions. That might be problematic. And you can see a picture of a funnel flow down here. Here is a, a hopper, and in, filled inside here are some glass beads. The glass beads are white. They're layered in white layers, and then some painted ones that are black. So when this started off, the, the black layers were horizontal, like that. And then as it's discharged, you can see that you get those stagnant regions near the wall here and then the material flowing through the central channel. So that's a good example of a funnel flow. And then I showed on this slide also a case of cohesive bridging. So it's not really a flow mode, but it's, it's an example of where the flow stops. So some materials are cohesive and they'll develop some strength as they get compressed. And they can develop enough strength that they form a bridge that supports the weight of the material sitting above it. And so in this case, there is no flow in this particular hopper. It's it flowed for a little bit and then stopped because this cohesive bridge was strong enough to prevent the rest of the material from discharging. Now related to hopper flow, uh, there was a study performed by Turborg at Bayer. Turborg performed tests with 500 different particulate materials and then tabulated the percentage of hoppers that would flow in mass flow as you change the hopper wall angle. So 500 different materials, and you change the wall angle to see what percentage of those materials would flow for different angles. What, what angle should you put on a hopper to make sure material is going to flow? 45 degrees is a very common number that people use. It's kind of, you know, it's right in the middle between 0 and 90 degrees. So people say 45 degrees. If you put a wall angle at 45 degrees, it turned out none of those 500 materials flowed in mass flow. It turns out that just didn't work very well. You'd get funnel flow or maybe you'd have flow stoppages. Even at a 15 degree angle from the vertical, only 70% of the, the materials flowed in mass flow. There were still another 30% that didn't flow in mass flow. And again, at 15 degrees is a pretty steep angle. That corresponds to this picture right here. So it's, it's not just trivial to just put a 45 degree wall and just expect flow. 
It's more complicated than that, as we'll see later in the course. And so what happens when you have funnel flow or cohesive bridging, um, these kinds of problems, you get situations like this. You, it's not uncommon, um, like here on the left, where they'll have a guy go out with a big stick. Here's your hopper. You can see this looks like it's about 45 degrees. And they bang on the side of this. This guy's standing in some sort of bucket loader here. Very unsafe. Um, you bang on the side of it and hopefully discharge the material. You know, it kind of falls from the sides and goes through the exit, hopefully. Uh, this is another common one you, where you send a guy out there with a sledgehammer and just bang on the side of this thing. It's not ideal, obviously. You know, you spend tens of thousands of dollars to get this thing built, and then you go and pound on it with a sledgehammer. You'll get this denting pattern on here that's sometimes called hopper rash. So here's another example of hopper rash on the hopper where people have banged on it to try to get it to flow. Here's another example of a silo. So here's a silo here, and there was a silo here, but that silo has collapsed. So the, remember the statistic before where I said that about a thousand silos failed each year in North America. So here's an example of one that's failed. So some, somehow it was not designed properly and uh, it collapsed. And then the one on this side is kind of an interesting one. This is a, a silo where the material, I suspect, I'm not sure, but I suspect the material had low permeability as it was discharging. So low permeability means that the air can't flow in the gaps between the particles very well. And so as the material discharged, there was no way for air to come back in and fill in the empty space that the material used to be in. And so it produced a partial vacuum inside this silo. And so the pressure in here was lower than the atmospheric pressure and it caused it to buckle as a result. And then there's another example that I'm not showing here. It's uh, powder flooding. So you can click on this video link to, to see an example of it. But powder flooding is a, a case where you have some material maybe that was in a, a funnel flow and stuck on the side of the hopper and then it suddenly starts to discharge and as it suddenly discharges it becomes aerated. So you get a lot of air that's, that, that gets entrained in between those little gaps and then the material instead of not flowing well at all actually flows very well. It flows basically like a fluid and it comes out of the hopper in a very uncontrolled fashion. And so it'll, it'll end up coming out and then just flowing all over the place and creates a huge mess and you have to shut it, the process down to clean it up. So take a look at powder, the powder flooding video for that. So these are examples of powder flow or hopper flow problems. Some more examples of hopper flow problems, just cartoon sketches. So uh, this is an example of buildup material on the walls like we talked about with funnel flow. This is an extreme case of that called rat holing. I'll show you a picture of a rat hole in just a moment. But rat holing is, is where the discharge is really from one single narrow channel in the material and you get a large buildup of material at the walls. This one's particularly dangerous because if it's a big silo and you have all this material and then that material suddenly collapses, you get some very large dynamic loads that can uh, cause the, the hopper to collapse. Here's an example of bridging or arching, you know, cohesive bridge that has formed and prevented that material from discharging. Here's another case of that, they call it plugging here, where it's bridged at the exit. It could be cohesive bridging or maybe mechanical bridging and just nothing discharges from here. So in these cases, you know, in all of these cases, people will often go in and try to bang on the side of the hopper or try to inject air to get it to flow or do some sort of agitation to it to get flow to occur. And here's an example of a, a rat hole. So this picture, just imagine looking down from above and you can see that hole. You can see why it's called a rat hole. It looks like something a rodent would crawl through. Uh, this was in a pharmaceutical blending process. They actually had uh, some powder in a tote blender. It's a type of blender. It opened up the exit of the tote blender. It's kind of a hopper shape. And instead of all the material discharging from that container, it was just a very narrow channel discharged. So when you have these hopper flow problems, or powder flow problems, um, they can affect the downstream processes. The bullet points I have here are specifically really for the pharmaceutical industry, but you can imagine them being applied to other industries as well. So for example, if you have non-uniform flow, so, so intermittent flow in these hoppers, that can cause unacceptable tablet weight uniformity. So in the manufacturing of pharmaceutical tablets, they store material in hoppers and you have other powder flow processes. And if that flow isn't nice and uniform, the, the resulting tablets can have different weights. And then if, if it's too much variability, you have to get rid of those tablets. Non-uniform flow can cause equipment damage or uncontrolled flow. So for example, I was talking about big hoppers. 
If you get material that's stored in there and doesn't flow very well and then suddenly it collapses, it can produce very large dynamic loads. Or you can get that uh, powder flooding kind of behavior, which is uncontrolled. Uneven flow can cause segregation of active ingredients. So that, again, this is specifically for the pharmaceutical industry, but it can just cause segregation of ingredients. We can read it that way. We'll talk about this more later, but when you have funnel flow in a hopper, you get this sort of V-shaped free surface pattern where the material avalanches down that free surface. And when you get that kind of flow pattern, you can get segregation where, where you get the larger particles will tend to discharge first with the finer particles being left behind as they discharge. And so you get variability in the content of the material. The mixture changes over time as it discharges. The next one, uh, pore flow may require force feeders, vibrators, cu custom hoppers. So these are all things that are done to try to fix pore flow problems. So for example, vibrators are very common. If you have this kind of pore flow in your hopper, you might actually, instead of banging on it with a sledgehammer, you might put a motor on here, attach a motor that's unbalanced. So as that motor rotates, it causes vibration on the hopper wall and that, that hope hopefully will cause the material to flow near the wall. Another way that they'll do this sometimes is they'll inject air next to the wall to try to hope, hopefully try to get the material to move rather than stay stagnant. But these are all fixes after the fact. Ideally, you, you wouldn't need to do these things if they were designed properly from the start. The next bullet point, uh, pore flow can result in irreproducible manufacturing operations. So let's say something goes wrong, you're trying to diagnose it and fix it. If you have intermittent flow, it may it's just changing each time. It's, it's hard to diagnose that or get any sort of consistency that you can fix. It becomes more random rather than just consistent offset or bias. So it's harder to fix. And then lastly, poor flow can decrease process yields due to inefficient material handling and high reject levels. So obviously, if you're getting poor content uniformity, inconsistent tablet weights, things like that, those products you may have to discard them and so you get low process yields. Nobody wants that. So I now am going to show a few interesting things that uh, are a little bit unusual compared to like fluid mechanics. So here's one for example, hopper flow rate. So let's say you're discharging from a hopper. Here I show an hourglass, but you have some material in here and it's discharging and you measure the mass flow rate right there as it's discharging. If you're dealing with a liquid, what you would find is that the mass flow rate is dependent on this height. So they call it the, the head sitting above the exit. So it's, it's the height of the, the liquid would affect the mass flow rate. You can get this from Bernoulli's equation. But when you're dealing with a particulate material and it's sufficiently tall here, it turns out the height doesn't play a role. So here's what we call the Beverlew equation. It's the mass flow rate coming out of the, the orifice here, some constant. This is the bulk density of the material, that's gravitational acceleration. This is the diameter of the exit, so it's this diameter right here. Here's another constant, and that's the particle size, particle diameter. But you can see nowhere in here it does the height show up. So the discharge rate from a bin containing particulate material is independent of the height of the material sitting above it. And we'll talk more about this later in the course. So that's very different behavior than what you'd get for a liquid, for example. So again, just another place where your fluids intuition would steer you in the wrong direction. Here's an example showing segregation. I've talked about that a few times. Uh, this, this device comes from Jenny Keen Johansson. It's a nice little demo. But what we have here are two different particulate materials. The yellow material is a fine material, so smaller particles. And then the kind of grayish black material, they're larger, they're coarser, so they're bigger. And so we can start with them well mixed here and then flip this thing upside down so that the material that was up here discharges. And you can see as it discharged, the material has segregated. You get the, the fine material collecting in the middle and then the coarse material collecting on the edges. So here, you know, you might have a mixing operation where everything is nicely mixed, nice and uniform, that's great. And then you go to empty your hopper that contains that mixed material and then it suddenly becomes unmixed again and you get poor content uniformity. So segregation is typically undesirable. And so um, you can see a good example of it here. It typically occurs when you're dealing with free flowing materials with different size, but different densities can play a role, different particle shapes can play a role and so on. We'll talk more about it later. Here's another interesting example of screw feeding of material from a hopper. So here we have a hopper filled with material 
And then we have a screw feeder down here at the bottom, so it's kind of in a chamber like this. And we're going to try to feed the material out. The screw feeder itself looks kind of like an Archimedes screw. It's just a, a screw shape that conveys the material along. And so what ends up happening is material from the hopper only actually discharges from a small region. You could even design this to be a mass flow hopper, but the interface with the feeding mechanism can turn it into one where the uh, only a certain region of the material actually flows. So what ends up happening here is the material discharges and fills the volume between the screw flights. And so now the volume between the screw flights are filled. And as they get conveyed downstream, there's no place for this material to go. It, the, all the screw flight volume is filled up. And so this material ends up just being stagnant. It doesn't, it, there's no place for it to, to go in the screw. And so it'll only discharge from a small region here. So again, an interesting phenomena that you wouldn't normally expect. And there's a little video here where you can see this in action and ways to, to correct for it. So here we are at the very end. I just want to summarize some of the things we've talked about here. So first of all, particle science and technology or particle science and engineering, it's a broad topic and it covers a wide range of industries. So you know, chemical industry, pharmaceuticals, uh, mining, food products, explosives, you know, just a wide range of, of topics. So it has applicability for many engineers and uh, it covers a range all the way from dealing with the raw materials to the end product. So very broad range. And most engineers, particularly in the US, have little background how to design for particulate materials. Usually when people get some training in this, it occurs after their BS level engineering or in science degree. So it's usually coming after they've graduated. Powder flow is a particularly important topic, is a particularly important topic to understand. I showed a lot of statistics uh, with you know, how much money is invested, how many products are dealing with particulate materials, some of the problems that um, poor design has caused. And then I've showed some examples of where particulate system behavior can be significantly different from fluid system behavior. So for example, the discharge of a hopper, you know, you get these stagnant regions, the mass flow rate's independent of the, the head rise, uh, situations with segregation, you know, all these things are very different than what you would get if you're dealing with a fluid. So you can't necessarily apply your fluid mechanics knowledge to particulate systems. So that concludes this first introductory lecture. I give on the next slide a bunch of references if you want to learn a little bit more about the, some of the things I talked about in this video lecture. Future video lectures are going to focus more on the actual topics in the course.